Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jeffrey Smith, the director of Stadia.org. We appreciate your attendance here today. And uh, we have some good information to cover. We're excited to get started and, and to go through this to make sure that you can hear me if in, in the chat feature. If you don't mind listening, uh, changing, call up the chat window and then changing the settings to where it says to all panelists, change it to all panelists and attendees, and then just tell us where you're from. And um, just to make sure you can hear me okay, make sure that uh, you know where the chat feature is. Good, good, so hello, say Dorothy. Okay, Massachusetts, very good, glad. So that means that you can hear me, that's always a good thing, because as we sit here talking to a computer screen, uh, never know if it is um, coming across okay. So welcome, we, uh, we hope you enjoy this today. So the question is, does training matter? Now, I can't answer that question, but let's go to the next question which is the steady training matter. Now that's the question we're gonna talk about here today and how, how can we ad address it and what can we do? We, we've recently done a survey that um, gave us, oh, so you're saying the audio is a bit echoey. So maybe is my mic too hot? Is that any better? We don't like it echoey, it's frustrating, so. See if that's any better. So does training matter? And does steady training matter? Uh, that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Again, my name is Jeffrey Smith. I'm the president and CEO of Steady.org. I'm the one on the far right. On the call today also is Jessica. She's our trainer and educational, uh, head of the education department. And then Kelly Stone, also client success. Uh, so all those are here and um, uh, Sam is not here with us today, but there's his uh, picture if you have never met Sam. So this survey that we're going to talk about and the data that has come from this survey, let, I just want to explain a few things and so we, we can uh, make sure that we're understanding the terminology and what we're talking about today. So in the survey, we asked, do you have a teaching degree? Meaning, so the bottom one with a teaching degree is a four year teaching degree or an alternative certification. So they've actually been trained uh, in a formal manner to be a teacher. So we ask these individuals, do you have a teaching degree or do you have something else such as a substitute license, college degree, uh, some college, high school diploma, and those things are other than in education. And uh, so we're gonna separate those with a teaching degree and those without a teaching degree as we go through here today. Also, we're gonna talk about those who have completed the steady subskills training and those who have not. Now, when we, we sent the survey uh, out, this, these were two questions, and so we're gonna separate the data in using these four, four criteria. We had a 359 who had a teaching degree, so 30% of the respondents had a teaching degree. Uh, we had 70% who did not have a teaching degree. And that seems to be very typical with school districts nationwide, regardless of large or small, uh, but it's plus or minus right around 30% or a third, um, you know, which would be 33%. So 30, this falls in line with, with what we typically find within uh, school districts. And you can compare that with yours data from your school and see if that's correct. Um, those that have taken subskills in this sampling, there were 37% who had, there were 63% who had not taken uh, subskills. So the sample size here is about 1,200. Uh, the reason there's a, um, a range there is uh, some people answered some questions, some people didn't answer other questions. So some questions had 206 respondents, or 1,206, some had uh, 1,194. That is, so that's kind of the range, about 12% of the total sample size. What we did is, is we sent out a survey. We, we have a, a master list that, of substitutes all across the country from many, many, many school districts. And we did a random sampling of that of 12,000. And we sent about 12,200. We sent out uh, an invitation to take this survey. We had about 1,200 respond. 
So about 10% of those that were invited to participate in the survey actually participated, which is pretty high. Now, the random sample, uh, because it was the, the initial invitation was random, uh, this is also random. What we, what we find is when the data starts coming in and we have maybe a couple of hundred respondents responding to those surveys, if we start looking at the data, they tend not to change the larger we get. Um, especially if we've done it randomly. And uh, if, if we send it out to school districts and have them invite their substitutes, well, uh, one district, a large district might send it out and all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of respondents from that sp particular district and it might skew it um, here, this, uh, you know, at that time. But if we're doing it randomly, it, when we get a couple of hundred and then till we get to a thousand and if we kept going, the data doesn't change that much that we have experienced. So just so you know, I just wanted you to understand who we're talking to. Here's the age group of those people who participated. And again, I think this represents usually what happens uh, within most schools, the spread here. Uh, uh, and this is lumping everybody together, but you can see the demographics of those who participated. Also the male, female, this tends to be just spot on anywhere right in here, about 80-20 uh, for male, female. So I think it's a fair representation. The reason I went through all that is, is I think it, I wanted to show that it was a fair representation of people, uh, of substitute teachers who tend to be typically in, in most school districts. And so the data I think in here is relevant and is uh, stable as far as a good sample size. All right, now let's, for those that might not know exactly what steady subskills train, online training is, uh, the, it's $39.95, uh, that's what a substitute would pay, or if a district purchases, there's quantity discounts, but it's an eight hour college level course. So um, uh, with an assessment, and an individual can take the assessment up to four times, and districts usually set their passing score. We recommend an 85% passing score, and one who, happens to register, go quick right to the assessment and take it, most likely will not pass it. It's, it's uh, intended to test the material as presented and uh, that one has to go through the course in order to really be able to pass the assessment. They have four attempts and so if one is, um, uh, is interested in learning, they tend to be able to, to go through and pass it. And so it's encouraging uh, to when they take it because they can find uh, solutions to what they'll face in the classroom as well as it uh, they give them four attempts it is individuals are given four attempts to pass it so what is taught in it is uh, these uh, these five major categories and we did quite a bit of research on what substitute teachers should have knowing that we don't have four years to train a substitute We're, and and when the sub skills was written was written for that 70% uh, who don't have teaching degrees. We wanted to give, if they have a teaching degree, if they've gone through college, uh, they've been trained by a good university or, or uh, training program. And, uh, and so what we wanted to do is focus on those individuals who don't have a teaching degree. And, um, and so that's why we separate out the, uh, uh, these individuals so we can uh, just focus on individuals who don't have a teaching degree. So classroom management, behavior management is a large portion. Uh, teaching strategies, meaning those things that a permanent, those strategies a permanent teacher would use to implement a lesson plan, a substitute teacher needs to know those. Being prepared and professional, that's the number one complaint administrators have for substitutes is they're not showing up on time, they're not ready for the day, they're not prepared. And so that's what being prepared and professional is. Um, and then working with students with special needs, it's always important to help uh, substitute teachers uh, to be comfortable working with students with special needs, whether it's in an inclusion class or a separate class, but we want them to take on special ed assignments. And so there's a chapter on that. And then the appropriate use of fill-in activities. When we surveyed permanent teachers and asked them who your favorite substitute teacher was and why, Without exception, it was Miss So and So or Mr. So and So who had a resource kit or a bag of tricks or uh, something that they could pull 
a lesson out of it uh, at a moment's notice, or they were filler activities and so, and, and things that a, a teacher would accumulate over time. And a substitute who had that tended to be very com comfortable going into the classroom and being ready for any situation. And so we spend quite a bit of time talking about the sub pack and, and what should go in it and, and uh, how that um, can be used and why it can be used. So those are the, when we're talking about sub skills, these are the, these are the strategies and techniques that they have uh, been trained in. And it, these are very specific. Now, when we talk about classroom and behavior management, there are four principles and five skills. One of those skills, for example, is starting the learning immediately, meaning by uh, have a learning activity on the board, an invitation to learn on the board. And so when the students walk into the, to the class, they know immediately the, the, what they're supposed to do and uh, they can get right to work. The bell rings and they can move on. The longer it is from the time the bell rings before the work starts, the harder it is to get them back on task and to work throughout the day. So that one skill, for example, if we could train all of our teachers just to do that one thing, it would have a big impact across the board just to have that uh, invitation to learn activity on the board so they're ready uh, when the students walk in or, or come in in the day. And uh, they also, it sets, also sets an expectation to the students that, yes, I am a substitute teacher, but I am an educator. And I know that what your permanent teachers do, that's what they do. And so we want to mimic those kind of things. So that's one of many of the skills that are taught in classroom management. So what we're talking about here in this training is very specific things that they can practice and do and get better and better at. So that's the sub skills. All right, now let's go into uh, some, some of the data. Are we doing okay? I'm just going to keep talking because I like talking to my screen about numbers. And so we're going to keep going. <laughs> And so the, one of the questions, number one, did you substitute teach online, which is teach remotely since the pandemic started? Now notice the date on this was as of August 20th. So this, we wanted to see who had taught kind of last spring, not necessarily who maybe started this fall, but who had started. Now with the, there on the right side, you can see without a teaching degree, these are individuals who have had a teaching degree and uh, it shows that um, the top line is yes and the bottom line is no, meaning, so we compared those individuals who had taken sub skills, yes, and, uh, compared to those who had not taken sub, sub skills, no. All right, so that's how we read this chart. So this chart shows that those individuals without a teaching degree, as we see on the right side, and the top line of those who have taken sub skills, yes, and those who had not. So what it's saying that 16.49% of the individuals who had taken sub skills had taught in the classroom, 8.79% of those who had not taken sub skills had not had had uh, taught in the schools. So what that's saying is that if if an individual has taken uh, so those individuals, there you can see the bottom, those who have taken sub-skills are twice as likely to have taught remotely since the pandemic started as of August 20th. So, it, which is interesting. We thought, wow, why is that? And, and so this prompted us to, to start to look more deeply into the data that here, just because they've taken the sub-skills, they are twice as likely to have taught remotely. Now this next question, uh, this next slide takes out, uh, because we thought, well, what happens with certified teachers, those who have a teaching degree? So notice on the right, it says with a teaching degree. Notice those who had taught remotely, 31%, as opposed to 12% who had not. Those, so at the bottom it reads, those who have taken sub-skills are two and a half times more likely to have taught remotely since the pandemic started. This was just blew our, blew my mind when we looked at this without, you know, some had taught remotely, but the, those individuals who had the teaching degree and had taken sub skills were two and a half times more likely to have taught uh, uh, remotely. Now, which is fascinating to me. Why, why would that be the case? They're certified teachers. You would think that would be exactly the same um, with that. So, that kind of prompted us to say, well, what about all the rest of the questions? So all the rest of the questions in the survey 
uh, for the first time, we're comparing, uh, looking at those individuals who've taken subskills and those who haven't, regardless if they have a teaching degree or not a teaching degree, uh, just because we were surprised at, at the results here. So the question is, how likely are you to use the following skills to fill in for a permanent teacher in a remote learning environment? So in the subskills, remember I said they use, we taught, we teach classroom or behavior management, and that is taught as if it's a classroom, not necessarily if you're online. And that's the way it's been up until uh, this year. You know, we weren't teaching remotely, we're teaching. And, and that's, so that's, those, these individuals have taken the sub skills and it just talks about behavior management in the classroom. So if they have taken sub skills, they're at 43.99% said that very likely they would use behavior management skills as taught in sub, they would use that as opposed to 32% if they haven't taken sub skills. One, they don't know what, what behavior management skills are and they don't know how to use them. So that makes sense because this is without a teaching degree. Those who haven't been trained uh, in a college to be a teacher, uh, they're more likely. So they're 35% more likely. So is the, is the training effective? Yeah. If you're 35% more likely to, to have, to you be prepared uh, to teach uh, in a remote learning environment. You know, and, and so that these are, which is fascinating just because of sub skills. Now let's take the next slide. This is with a teaching degree. So you're 32, an individual is 32% more likely to use behavior management in teaching online than those who have not taken sub skills. So even certified teachers who have taken sub skills are more likely to use it in, in, uh, if they've taken sub skills. What about teaching strategies? Uh, this is uh, th those activities that a teacher would use in the classroom. That's what they were taught. Without a, those individuals without a teaching degree are 29% more likely to use teaching strategy skills in an online environment than those who have not taken sub skills. Um, so they're more, they have more tools to use and they would use, tend to use those more in an online environment. Um, that was, oh yeah, so this is teaching strategies for those who have a teaching degree. So you're 12% more likely. They have been taught these teaching strategies. And so, yes, it is a little bit more, um, but this is what more or so closer what I would have expected to see across the board, these two columns to be uh, the same between if they have a teaching degree. So again, uh, being prepared and professional, those strategies that you would use, 15% um, more likely if you're non-certified, 31% uh, more likely, oh, I didn't use it because that was pretty much the same. So the next question, if that makes any sense, I just, this, I'll go back. So being prepared and professional, 15% more likely to be, use those and understand being prepared and professional in an online environment. So sub-skills, even as is, is effective in helping them teach better online and be ready to teach online. Now, working with students, this is without those individuals, working with students with special needs. Those individuals who don't have a teaching degree, so 41% as opposed to 31%, and that is 31% more likely to use help if they've taken sub-skills. What about with a teaching degree? It's 8% more likely. This is the appropriate use of fill-in activities, even online. They're 22% for those without a teaching degree and 42% with a teaching degree. Oops, that's a next, next question. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. So appropriate use of fill-in activities with a teaching degree. The next one is, okay, if asked today, how prepared are you to have the skills to return to the classroom? Without a teaching degree, those who've taken sub skills are 42% more likely to be prepared to have the skills to return to the classroom than those who have not. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. Now, uh, that's without a teaching degree. Let's look at those with a teaching degree. Those who have taken sub skills are 44%. Those certified teachers who have taken sub skills are 44% more likely to be prepared to have the skills to return to the classroom than those who have not. 
that was interesting because they've been trained to do that. Yet the sub skills course intended for non-certified folks uh, are, is very helpful uh, to those who are certified. Jeff, I just wanted to pop in and say that it seems to me with all the school districts I talk to, this is Kelly, by the way, I, all the school districts I talk to that they're more and more having to hire people without teaching degrees. So this is really important, you know, when you've got to take someone who maybe has a bachelor's degree, but no classroom experience. It's really interesting to know that they can get those skills they need to feel comfortable to do what they need to do. Very good. And that's why even though we're comparing without a teaching degree and teaching degrees shows that it, these are, these are skills that, that are used by those who don't have a teaching background and those who do have a, a background. Those, if it wasn't ef effective, so these certified teachers would say, no, I wouldn't be using those things. No, I wouldn't be using those things. So yeah, it is very effective for those without a teaching degree. So if asked today, how prepared are you to have the skills to teach online for a permanent teacher? Those, uh, again, this is, these are individuals who don't have a teaching degree. Those individuals who have taken sub skills are 100% more likely to be prepared to, to have the skills to teach online than those who have not. So uh, huge jump, huge jump. Notice the certified teacher, those who, those individuals, this is individuals who have a teaching degree who have taken sub skills are 145% more likely to be prepared. That's even a bigger jump to teach online just for teaching sub skills. How about to tutor online? Now, the reason we're talking tutoring is uh, if the schools are teaching remotely, uh, most likely substitutes aren't being used as much. And so you have a lot of substitute teachers, but you have students who don't have uh, access like they did to the permanent teacher and so could substitute teachers be tutors and so we ask if you were tutoring online you know how likely would how how helpful would these teach these uh, skills be and 37 percent said more uh, than those who have not so those who had taken sub skills were 37 percent more likely to be prepared to tutor uh, students so the learning is going on uh, remotely, but yet if a substitute was to tutor those students to help them uh, stay up with the class, then they'd be 37% more likely to be prepared. Now with a teaching degree, it's 77% more likely, which is interesting just for that skill. So to return to the classroom, if asked today how safe, now that's interesting, how safe do you feel? And if they've taken sub skills, they're 36% more likely. Now, why does that have anything to do with, what does sub-skills have anything to do with safety? Um, as we look at it, we think that it's, uh, once they feel like they've been trained and they have some more skills, that they have the ability to learn. They, they know what to look for to, to be safe. Uh, so they're 36% more likely to feel safe. This is individuals that don't have a teaching degree. With a teaching degree, they are 91% more uh, likely to feel safe returning to the classroom. So how safe did they feel to teach online? Well, you're online, so it's pretty safe. Uh, and uh, maybe they feel like they will get bullied or something, but it's 27% more likely to feel safe uh, with the sub skills with those that don't have a teaching degree. And then it's 32% more likely if uh, teach online to be prepared with a teaching degree. Um, is that a duplicate slide? I think that's a duplicate slide. Or did I go backwards? I went backwards. So again, the sub-skills online training is, is $40. It's the eight-hour college-level course with the assessment. And there's just the, uh, one of the districts that use our training. And if you want to go look to see how they do it, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you can take a look at that uh, with that. Um, so the steady training, we focus on substitute teachers, that's the sub-skills. We also have taken, since we know how to train an individual who don't ha doesn't have a teaching degree, we know how to train them. We also adapted the training for specialists, which are media specialists or music specialists and the other specialists used in the classroom uh, and the schools to, to help them with behavior management, to help them with teaching strategies and their role as they work with students. 
We have courses for paraprofessionals. Uh, we have uh, courses for permanent teachers. Uh, we have seen here that it's effective with, with certified teachers. Uh, they have performed uh, much better, uh, in some cases, 145% more likely to be prepared by taking subskills. And also we've taken our material and prepared it, especially during the pandemic time, to help parents teach at home. And it's not to homeschool, it's to help with this teaching strategies that would help them um, help their students while they're at home. And that is both in English and Spanish, because there are some areas that have uh, quite high Spanish speaking parents. And so we want them to be able to understand what they can do to help their students. So these are the different trainings that Steady has to offer. And it, with this survey, uh, we really have found a very clear, distinct uh, understanding of those who have taken the, uh, the steady skills training and those who have not and compared what's happening. So it's very easy to implement the training. One reason I wanted to put this up, this last slide uh, up was, um, so you can take a look at that and, and others. We have, if you want to reach out to Kelly and she can give you a list of, and show you others how they've done it. Um, the, one of the most effective ways we've seen it is if a school district will put it out there for uh, on their website for those individuals who don't have a teaching degree, take the subskills training for $39.95. And then once you've completed that, you can come and pick up an application. Now the application that doing that that way, it, you, it can be used as a recruiting tool. Uh, the, the training is very positive and motivating. And so it'll encourage those who want to be good teachers It'll show those who are just looking for a paycheck and just want to sit and read a book that, yeah, teaching is a little more rigorous than that. Um, but yet it's not intended to discourage those who really want to do a good job. So when they come to you, they've taken the subskills training at their own expense, and then you can give them preferential treatment. Uh, you can reimburse them for that once they're hired and work 10 days. There are many ways to do it where it doesn't cost the district anything, and you're not not discouraging people, you're using it as a recruiting tool. There are a lot of these well-educated individuals who've wanted to get into the classroom, but yet they, they, know, they know better because they haven't been trained. And so that's what this subskills training is for, is to help them understand what it's take. If it's done after the hire process, you, you lose the recruiting aspect of subskills. You'll validate that they're, they're glad that they have been uh, chosen to be in the classroom, but it, uh, you've already made the selection where this way, if you make it prior and have the substitutes pay for it, then they put forth some effort and, uh, and, and actually do it. And they're willing to do it because they, it's a good way for them to kick the tires to see if they want to be a substitute teacher. So that's, um, and Kelly can help explain that if you have any more questions with that. There's her, Kelly's information. If you want to reach out to her, there's Sam's and Jessica's as well, if you'd like to. Oh, that's the end of this, uh, formal uh, presentation and um, it's always fun uh, to talk numbers and uh, if you have any questions please reach out to us but um, for that I just wanted to say thank you for attending. So here I have on your screen um, a handout that will also be point posted there uh, at steady.org slash webinars. It has a more concise uh, reading, so you don't have to show your boss, for example, what did you learn? You can actually download this and, and show this. So it's the survey results from 2020. And so if asked today, how prepared are you to have the skills to return to the classroom? The first one is for non-certified. The second one is for certified. I think we put that right there. Those that don't have a teaching degree and those who do. So that's where you, if you see the two, one is the don't have a teaching degree and the second column is for those that do. And uh, then you've got that. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> what else? Because I wanted to show this, I forgot the, the, but it has kind of everything that we've talked about here on one sheet. And then it'll also describe a little bit about what the survey is, uh, you know, some of the demographics so that you can see that. So yeah. There you go. That'll be on there, stated.org slash webinars.
uh, here as soon as we can get this uh, recorded and posted.